All right, welcome along. So this is in no way an exhaustive example, but this is just uh, something that might catalogue what we've gone through in the class. Um, this is going to be Rhino to laser cutting, or Illustrator to laser cutting, or Rhino to 3D printing on an Ultimaker 3D printer, which could be also any type of 3D printer out there. Uh, depending on how good a model that you have made because everything comes down to precision from now on and that is one of the reasons why we're using this software over any other uh, down to its ability to make some cool stuff so the first thing that we can look at here is as you can see I'm in perspective um, full screen double click the word made my background two, <laughs> two color gradients and you can see my little shape here so it's actually quite small uh, if I draw another cube um, and he's only 25 by 25 by 25 is how I started and then I just chopped away and added some uh, you know move some edges that kind of a thing uh, so what I need to really check is that this is suitable for printing on the 3d printers that we've got in the studio and the first thing that we can do um, is just kind of throw it at the software and see if it will print and to be honest the software is uh, and the studio printers are very forgiving so I'm quite confident this is going to work out okay uh, so what I can do here is uh, first of all because it takes a little bit of time is open Cura C-U-R-A Ultimaker Cura I think this is an older version now 4.7 there's a new one out there it takes a few moments to load and this software is the interface that we always quite um, ubiquitous when it comes to 3d printing there are others out there uh, but this is the one that we use with our machines um, <clears throat> in the studio we've got a few machines we've got an Ultimaker 2 Go which is a baby one we've got an Ultimaker 2 Extended which is the plus model uh, we've got an Ultimaker 2 Plus and we've got an Ultimaker 3 so there's a few different variants and they were all available. You can see the differences online. I'm not going to let go over that. Uh, one thing that we do need to know though is we've got a nozzle size difference uh, and that is how much goop can come out of the uh, extruder at any one point. So uh, the Ultimaker 3 that I'm going to be using here is a 0.4 millimeter nozzle and that is the resolution essentially or how much plastic can come out of the uh, print head at any one time. And uh, the one of the printers I think it's the extended plus has a 0 0.8 millimeter nozzle uh, which means that the prints uh, can come out with good high resolution but also they can be very quick because it's twice as much material coming out the compared to the machine I've got next to me here so with that said this is the interface it's really straightforward uh, Ultimaker Cura it already knows what machine I'm using if it doesn't know what machine you know if you've downloaded the software for this exercise uh, you need to go to uh, printer, add a printer, and you can choose a range of machines that we've got here, to extended plus, to extended, to plus, etc. They're all there. Or there's a myriad of uh, third-party printers you can choose from. Now, these types of printers are very affordable uh, as far as printers go. They're about 200 quid. Now, if you've got a spare 200 quid, I would recommend going and buying one of these because they are... Uh, very versatile pieces of equipment um, but anyway we do have a few in the studio for you to use so the first thing I'm going to do here is um, export my Rhino model in a format that allows me to open it in Cura and to do that I'm going to select the object I'm going to go file export export selected and I'm going to drop it very lazily on the desktop in a format called STL all the way at the bottom it's in alphabetical order so head down to STL so that's stereolithography STL format and uh, STL means standard tessellation language or st standard triangulation language I don't know. go on Wikipedia figure it out so I'm going to call this uh, test model um, save it just click OK on all the random values. Uh, defaults, just curse yes, 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 yes. Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, we'll go back to Cura and we'll open this up. And there he is, test model. Uh, a few things we might need to note here is uh, the interface is a little bit different. So right click orbits. Uh, we've got a few different colors here. We've got yellow for the main object. 
Um, if I go underneath it, we've got red. So red means overhang. And the way that these machines work um, is like a hot glue gun suspended by a uh, little metal rod. Uh, so as you can imagine, if you pressed on a glue gun, it would uh, drizzle out the nozzle. And uh, that's basically what's going to happen on this uh, example here. So anywhere that's red is called an overhang. And the overhangs are going to be quite crucial that they have material underneath them in order for that edge to be supported and print as you would expect. Um, so looking at this geometry is pretty straightforward. Um, one thing we need to do is so open the file, uh, we choose the material. So if you've only got, uh, the Ultimaker 3 has got two print heads, but 99% uh, of the time we're going to use PLA with a 0.4 nozzle. And we've got some very basic settings here. We can print at a high speed, low resolution. Now that should actually still come out pretty uh, high res, to be honest, anyway. 0.2, and you can go extra fine look. So that's 0.06 millimeters per layer. It will take a very, very long time. And I don't really know what the uh, advantages or disadvantages of that might be. Um, really, I only ever print at normal and fast, you know, um, for a lot of my work. Um, We've got here something here called the infill, which is at 20%. Um, so when you 3D print, you don't necessarily get a full plastic part. Uh, you will get a what's called an infill density percentage. And um, so that's going to be 20% full of plastic. And that's usually quite typical. Uh, what's that one? That is support. So if you do have a model that... Um, has overhangs greater than 40 degrees or cutouts like this uh, it might be worthwhile adding support and again that all depends so what we'll do is we'll run it without first and we'll run it with after and then we've got this thing called here which is uh, built plate adhesion I think yep again most of the time you will have it on brim um, as we develop this uh, skills they can modify them but I would stick to the defaults at the moment so the first thing we need to do is uh, there's our objects in the print head print bed uh, we can press slice and uh, there we go it's going to take 50 minutes to print this object out it's going to take 12 grams of plastic which is 1.5 meters of the spool so not bad at all uh, what we definitely need to do though is go into this preview tab at the top or it was in the bottom as well and you'll see the 3d printed part uh, as it will be uh, created. So what I generally choose as well is layer view, definitely, but also I'm going to choose line type. So this allows us to see a bit better. So we've got uh, blue, which is the brim, which is the anchoring it to the bed. We've got red, which is the outer wall. We've got green, which is the, uh, these are called perimeters. So how many perimeters it's going to do. And then yellow is the top and bottom surface, okay? So this is what we should see. Now, it's quite important that we do this preview because uh, sometimes when we've made models, especially in things like Grasshopper and uh, we're, we're newbies with Rhino, we might get errors in the model, which mean that uh, it's not going to print. So it is very forgiving, but it does sometimes uh, you know, remind you that you need to uh, have a tidier, cleaner model before you export it and print. So as you can see, uh, we've got these top layers inside the perimeter. We've got these triangle shapes as part of our fill and support going down. You can see that cylinder cut through. And that all looks like it um, is going to work. And, you know, you can even watch the layer being printed virtually, um, which is pretty cool. So it's going to do the infill first, uh, outer loops, sorry, inner print inner perimeters which are green and then outer loops uh, outer perimeter which is red looking good um, and yeah I'm quite happy with that I'm ready to save to file and you save that to a USB stick or an SD card depending on the printer that you're using so you need to make sure you know what machine you're running it for before you start so you can play around with these values first of all so at the moment you can see that we've got it at 0 0.2 and you can see those overhangs uh, let's do fine uh, key changes I think and slice it again so that's added an extra 10 minutes for 50% um, increase in resolution so that's not too bad at all so I would probably run it a little bit higher res because you're only costing you 10 minutes and um, everything else looks exactly the same um, and finer still 
So, yeah, you know, you're really not adding extra time, really, to say you're going for the, that extra extra detail, uh, which is good. Maybe if I go on the fast setting, um, let's see what that looks like. 50 minutes. So you're looking at an extra half an hour to go from a low res to a high res. So maybe I can do a little demo with that and see how things look. Um, and really, that's kind of what I mess about with. I wouldn't necessarily think you need more infill or any less. And the brim... Oh, the support. Let's try the support. Support on normal slice. Let's see what happens. So you shouldn't need um, material on your... You shouldn't need support material on a model like this because the overhang is quite within the tolerances of the machine. And that means that every layer that it draws uh, on top of the previous layer, there's enough to actually adhere to the previous layer. Uh, where that might not be apparent or a plot possible is on that sphere, uh, sorry, that hole that we've cut through. So it will be supporting these layers. Uh, but as you can see, that's floating in space. It never really works out that way. So what I would recommend you do, you know, you're going to have to punch those out. And it can actually sometimes be messier than not even having any support material at all. Um, Maybe I should try a different model with a bit of a more severe overhang. And um, again, we'll add some images to this video uh, as we go along. So yeah, pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, if you go back to the model space, you know, we can use these objects on the right hand side. We can move it around the bed should you want to. Uh, you can scale it. Uh, um, if you know no measurement, it's coming a bit wrong. That's not too bad. Uh, or you could add, uh, you know, 125 in X and Z. And take the uniform scaling off. Didn't mean to do one. No, it's no, it's completely dead. There we go. Uh, rotate in any axis. And one of the better features here, look, is that you can actually choose uh, select the face to align to the build plate. So you can choose the face, and it will squash that down. Um, so sometimes you might want different surfaces to have different finishes on because the top surface usually has a nice, well, a flat edge and these perimeters you get quite a lot of detail in there as well. Um, you can mirror the object and you can, what's this called? Printer support, well there's a lot of options I've never played with. Uh, and I'm not going to bother today. Uh, you can right click though and you can do multiply so if you need five of these you only need to export it once and you want four additional copies and then you get five and you can arrange all the models on the plate. Sometimes it's quicker and more efficient for you to do it manually and uh, you know let's slice that. It's pretty quick at slicing so that's look at that exponential growth uh, so we think that you'd have five objects and I've messed about with the uh, orientation but you'd think that'd be about five hours but this is actually coming at seven and a half hours so we should be okay to actually I'm gonna save that save this machine running overnight uh, they are usually pretty solid uh, but please do speak to one of the team to double check that that is going to be okay uh, yeah so once you've done that save to file and um, go from there so you're gonna get some interesting looking objects coming through you've got some support there yeah, I don't know why it's got this little object support on the side. Uh, you do occasionally get those. Um, yeah, and that's that. Easy peasy. Uh, but maybe your object, you want to laser cut it. There's a few ways we can laser cut these objects. Um, you know that. Well, I should say as well that STL file you can send it anywhere, and most 3D printers will actually take that. There's an option in Rhino here called Check. I oh, know. What I need to do here is actually turn this object into a mesh. And I can do that just by typing mesh and type in or select OK here. <clears throat> and that should have made me a mesh duplicate. So you can see that when I select my object, I've got these what are called planar faces, these um, surfaces represented by a U and a V line, these squares or crosses. However, when I mesh the object, it turns it all into triangles. Um, maybe I can go into shaded and you can see the differences there. As far as I'm concerned the geometries are very accurate and will be represented well on the printer. You know it does uh, tessellate and it does 
um, segment what would be perfect spheres. Uh, so you do have a little bit of loss in resolution, but certainly for these square faces, uh, there's very, very little to none resolution loss. Uh, what I can do here is check the mesh. And we can see that um, it's good. Uh, it does not have any faces that are wrong, or the edges are okay. Uh, it is a valid mesh. Uh, another thing we can check here is volume. So I can check my original shape here for volume, and it will give me a, a cubic millimeter volume. Uh, if there was a hole in this model, and I choose volume, it's going to tell me that there's a hole and it can't choose a volume. Um, so that's a good indicator. So before you even mesh it, before you even export it to STL, I would check that it has a volume uh, and you are able to export this model. Uh, what else can we look at? Um, so maybe you want to laser cut this though instead. Maybe you really want to use a sheet of card or mount board or something to model this with. Uh, what we could do here is um, use a contour command. So uh, it's asking, I'm going to use a different view here. I'm going to use a side view. And the first thing it's asking for is the contour base plane. So I'm going to draw that at the bottom. And then it's asking me for a perpendicular to object. So I want my stacks, just like we saw on the 3D printer. I'm going to replicate that, but in cardboard. So I'm going to go vertical. And the distance between, uh, yeah, now I've got one millimeter card. And we've got our objects ready here to play around with. I turn my grid off with F7. Uh, it's quite tricky to see. You can select a layer. And that is the layer that you might want to go. This is going to be quite brutal when it comes to layering these out. Um, so what I'm going to do here instead is do contour again. Uh, and I'm going to choose, say, four. There we go, just to give us an idea. And when it comes to laying these out, it's quite manual. Uh, the best way for me to explain that is to use the con have them all selected, press Control and click the base one and move it along in the viewport so you can see it in the top here. Um, you've moved it so it uh, goes beyond the edge. Go back to perspective, press Control and click, move it along and repeat that process. The white's glitching out there. Uh -huh, so this has got the uh, hole in there. Yeah, there is a display glitch there, isn't there? I'm not entirely sure why. You get the idea that this is quite a process. But I'm going to use this in a sec to do the example in Illustrator for laser cutting. Okay, so it doesn't matter in 3D or in the different views that these things are all over the place. Because in the top, which is what I'll be exporting, they are all appearing flat. So I'm quite happy to keep them as they are. That was a contour command using the different layer heights. Uh, the other thing I can do is um, you can see that when I've built this shape one on top of the other, uh, it hasn't made a single face for this edge. So if I wanted to take this edge away and laser cut that, then I would have a few problems here. It would essentially see it as two shapes. So I can use a command here called unify, no, not unify, merge all coplanar faces. Merge all coplanar faces. And you can see that it's kind of taken those two faces and merged them into one. So it's merged all coplanar faces. And a few things we can do here. I think there's a command called um, unroll. Um, press OK. And there you go. You've got all the faces already laid out for you, which is pretty cool. And as you can see, it's overlapping these geometries that I've already created there. 
can move him out of the way. Okay. And then we've got all of those faces that we can... Now the thing is I don't really know which way around they go. So we've got at the back, the side, that ramp on the other side. Um, don't know where that bit is. All these little cubes. So it does give you the stuff to spit that spits out, but I'm not entirely sure where they all live in respect to this guy. Um, so another thing that I often do is not use unroll. I'm going to duplicate that object though. And I can use a command here called duplicate. Or well, how do I normally do it? Let's see. If you've got a uh, planar geometry like that, I might explode it and do the um, unroll like you would imagine a net, which is not too dissimilar to what we've just got the uh, software to do for us. Gives me a good idea, a bit more of an indication as to where these objects are going to go. Can fix that rotation in a minute. Uh, maybe you want to break this off into different areas. Little subcomponents. get the idea there I hope um, yeah so you can kind of begin to break your object down and think about how it's going to get reconstructed again it doesn't matter what it's looking like here uh, it only really matters in the top view for the laser cutter so what we need to do now is because the laser won't be able to see these surfaces is duplicate the edge now you know these objects aren't too complex because they're just planar and you can draw around um, the shapes but if they are a bit more organic in their form uh, you don't want to be messing about redrawing every edge so well, the command I'm going to use here is called duplicate DUP face border. Okay, DUP FACE border. Allows me to go in and select these objects. Press enter. And it's turned them into curves. How fantastic is that? See, I've got my curve objects there. So if I was to take these into the laser, um, you know, this is only one option. You don't have to come from Rhino. You can come from other software, uh, but really, I just want these edges. So what I'm going to do now is um, export, enter. Well, I suppose I can select those as well. I'm going to call this. Uh, tests for laser and I'm going to choose the format to be Illustrator you can choose PDF I'm going to because I have to make sure that you've done the export with the object selected in the top viewport that is fundamental if you do it in the excuse me different viewport you're going to get a weird result and you'll see that as soon as we open it in Illustrator but we'll go to top view first to select the objects Export selected, you know, again, top is selected, and I'm going to choose preserve model scale. One millimeter equals one millimeter, and then I can press OK. Test for laser. Um, and then I'm going to open it in Illustrator. So if I show my desktop, open that in Illustrator, yep. In that view. Cool. All right, so it has remembered pretty much where it was in relation to the origin on Rhino. Um, the origin is 0, 0, 0, so that's where the grid is, uh, which I've turned off, so F7. So it knows that I've exported it from this corner uh, on the grid, and um, again, if I overlay that in Illustrator, you can see that it's positioned it which means that when you export things you need to be sort of near zero because Illustrator only has 
a canvas which is like three meters wide and if your building is 25 meters wide um, it's not going to be able to export it all the way over to the most extents of your model so always make sure you're exporting them sort of close to the uh, center or origin a few things we need to pay attention to here uh, every laser shop is going to be different and every laser shop is going to have its own set of rules and requirements so you're going to need to go into those and open a dialogue with those people now for AUB and uh, hey create I know uh, what they are which is great so I can preempt a lot of this stuff I'm not entirely sure what that is what is that so maybe I can go in there and delete those lines uh, so it's a good opportunity here yeah just to see uh, what is going to work and what isn't going to work um, I've got a default template open I need to edit that I might need to move these around a bit depending on what software you're more, most familiar with uh, you know move them around in that software that's fine uh, these guys are currently not joined so I might want to go in and control J for join or not join is it uh, group control G and I can bring them a little bit closer together um, you don't have to have things touching uh, but if you do I would recommend at least a millimeter so I would grab the ellipse there um, and I'm going to just choose one millimeter one millimeter and you can put millimeters in even though it's set to points and you can see that I've got my uh, millimeter guide essentially here um, I don't know that that's way that's going to be fine so if visually that looks okay I can carry that on around the object I select my objects with the black arrow just like in InDesign and uh, I can select inside those objects with the white arrow deselect by clicking out click in again and uh, you know you can click in and out of objects with the different colored arrows or V and A I think it is yeah selection tool is V direct selection tool is A so I do want to um, not have that much space between them um, just to save on whatever material I might be using um, kind of bunch these up a bit use the arrow tools you know and again it might be worth doing that in Rhino uh, or CAD depending on what software you prefer uh, Illustrator has its quirks but you know we're not illustrators we're just going to use the laser so that means that all those quirks really we only need to use a handful of tools in order to get the results we need so I'm kind of grouping these um, a little bit closer there we go put these objects next to that Uh, a few other things we might want to think about is we need to know uh, the scale so this all should translate quite neatly uh, but one thing you could do is draw in a uh, rectangle which is click once on the canvas and do 25 millimeters 25 millimeters and that way that when you put in a text object um, you can just put in 25 by 25 millimeters okay and that way that the guy uh, the person who's running the shop knows that that you know you might want to put that in an email that that rectangle there is the scale okay just in case there's any translation issues uh, I want to compress this artboard as much as possible and um, I'm currently in the essentials um, which you might be used to because sort of works a bit like uh, InDesign here uh, what I need to go down to here though is edit artboards on the right hand side under properties and choose um, well, I think what I might do here actually is change my units so for windows I'm going to go into edit preferences units and I'm going to change all of that to millimeters uh, and then I'm going to go back to the artboards into properties and I'm going to change it to A4 let's say so it's going to be you know, that looks like it's landscape so 297210 just press the arrow selection tool and drag that around and plop it wherever you know to be honest 
who knows if they if you've asked for this to be cut in plywood or cardboard you know whoever has got it they might want it um they might just have loads of scrap so who's to say that if you just put it here it's going to be fine and uh they'll be moving this around accordingly so we've done a good job of tidying it up makes it look sort of square easy to select for whoever's going to be using it um and we just need to f check a few things here so if i go to where do i go let's go to the course blog How do we even get to the course blog? There we go. So I think I've put it on here already. Collaborative practice. So, okay. So it's uh, at the moment it's there. I'd make that a little bit more obvious. Submit your laser cutting files here. Don't forget to email Harry. Designs at Hey Create. I suggest with a copy of the link to make sure they cut it for you as per your specification. So if you click on there, uh, this will take you to um, the shared folder. And there's a few things we need to look at. So he's given us a README. So let's open that. Wow, 11 pages. And then if we go, oh, we can't go back just yet until this is loaded. Let's do download. Open. All right, so he's actually given us a laser file. Wow, okay, so this is pretty um, full on. So what's he got? Different materials, acrylic, thickness is a millimetre to six millimetres, coloured three to one millimetre in white, um, clear, translucent, matte frost, fluorescent, except pink, silver and gold, and why it's not an issue with pink, maybe you could order that in special. Uh, for special orders, you can visit this website and they'll give you all the recommended materials to choose. Woods, poplar ply, three mil to 15 mil, MDF, one mil to 12 mil, birch ply, 0.4 to nine mil, veneered MDF. Um, one mil MDF is expensive, so consider your options. One millimeter MDF in 600 by 400 sheets only. Card, grey board, thickness 1.4 mount board, one millimeter to three millimeter grey board. As you can see, we've got a range of colors in stock, but maybe you need to go and buy or specify specifically. Uh, these are the types of art, art boards available. So they've got different laser cutters. They've got five laser cutters and uh, they've used different machines for different materials. So if you want to use acrylic, you need to use an art board with this size. If you want to use woods, you need to use a material of this size. And if you've got a card and grey board, you use a material of this size. So hopefully that's quite straightforward. Uh, preparing files, please choose the smallest sheet that will fit all your pieces. Position parts with at least a two millimeter gap. All right, I'll have to double check mine and uh, unless you're sharing cut lines between parts. So if you're sharing cut lines, make sure you've deleted all the duplicate lines, which we can see. So in there, apparently, it's a very fine line, two millimeter gap, shared cut line, we'll look at that in a sec. Um, and we can see that we've got to change the color. So as I was say, each shop is gonna have its own different approach to this. Uh, it's going to be different to the AUB workshop to this guy as well. So double check what you need to use. So colors for all solid areas engraving, for example, text, use black. For a stroke engrave, use red. For cuts through all the way, uh, use blue. Uh, make sure you change text to outlines before submitting. Okay, we can go through that. Um, if you don't use that and you've used a custom font, then the laser company might not have that font and uh, you won't get your text it'll come out as aerial or something awful like that please use one illustrator file for each type of material so if you've got wood and acrylic use two car two materials so if you use two files if you need more than one sheet of something use multiple artboards okay yep we can look at different artboards and uh, within each illustrator file labor each artboard by thickness of material or color. Okay, so we need to put a label in there. Leave at least three millimeters between the edge of the sheet, so a margin. And if you and your course were using similar materials, consider combining your cutting into the same sheet. Please include your name and course in the file. Okay, so text.
Okay, so that's pretty much going to do that. And if I want to do something with a cool, crazy logo, um, obviously, oops, obviously, I am the last person to ask about cool names and logos. Uh, well, let's say that I'm going to use this font. Um, I need to make sure that uh, the laser is going to see this. So at the moment, this is just a text object with a text file, like a text object. Um, so again, the laser company or whoever you send this to a print shop might not have that. When it's selected, you need to right click and do create outlines. And uh, that has basically just turned that into a shape with um, strokes. So it's almost like a CAD file almost okay and that means that I can then uh, if I wanted to be so inclined double clicked on that yep I can put that on here so that's going to engrave and we'll look at some examples of what they look like later uh, cool name uh, can it be engraved everything else wants to be cut out doesn't it or maybe I can do a couple of different options as well. So change all of my lines to, what did it say? Blue, black fill, contour lines, red. It doesn't say anything about RGB. Okay, so the moment you need to make sure your color mode, so that's file, color mode is set to RGB, good. And I'm gonna select all my shapes, except for that text there. And I'm going to go to the appearance under the properties tab. At the moment, fill is question marked. I'm going to click on it and choose the zero fill. Oh, except for that text. And give that black. And then the stroke is going to be set to uh, blue. No, at the moment, I don't have any colors. So I'll choose this art palette. I'll give it black for now. Um, got a bit weird, got a grayscale slide. I'm going to choose this burger bar menu in the top right of that panel called RGB. And you can see that I've now got sliders. So red, green to zero, blue to 255. And I've now got, um, don't want a blue cut on my text. Blue lines for cutting. And what I'm going to do here is I want a what they call a kiss cut or a stroke line engrave. Um, I want uh, engraving maybe panel lines. I'll change that to red. So full red, zero on the other colors. Uh, so that was shift and alt and drag to drag it down and then control D to duplicate. So, for example, that's going to just do a, a marking engrave on there. Um, and we'll see if we can find some examples of that for you to understand. And that's pretty much that. So I can save this out. I don't know what that means. Don't show me that again, please. Uh, test for laser. Just save over it. That's fine. Um, Illustrator. Yep, yeah, whatever. Okay. And then I can submit it to that folder. And once it's done that, I can share. Obviously, I've got to give it a sensible name. And uh, is there anything else I'm supposed to do with that? Please include your name and course in this name file. Yeah, okay. Um, and then you can email as per the course blog, uh, which is a few pages back. That designs that hey creates with the link of this and um, share away. Okay, and make sure you get your file. One thing I forgot to look at here was duplicate artboards. 
Let's say you've got loads of things you want cutting in three more poplar ply. You just go under the properties, you can do edit artboards and you can draw a new artboard and give it a new size. A3, for example. Okay, so then you can have multiple works on diff ah, different artboards. And hopefully that covers most of that stuff. Um, we've got loads of examples. Oh, we've also got one here called Chitty Box, which is um, the software that we use for the very fancy resin based printer. And it's very much the same as um, Cura. Okay, so the difference here is the resolution is significantly higher. Um, especially for these detailed models. So at the moment this model is too big, you can move it around really quite freely. Anything that's bigger than the build platform as you can see goes red. Um, you can rotate it nicely. Scale really easily. So what I generally do is scale to fit uh, because I want my objects to fit. Uh, the only thing is you've got to make sure that things are, too, are not too small, the details. Um, and when we, we also have to put in the support material. You have to use support material on this machine, as far as I'm aware. Now, if you go online and watch videos on how to use Chitu Box, um, uh, then you will tell, you'll see people say never ever use the default um, supports. But, you know, I have some good results with them. Um, they are a little bit big sometimes and you know, not necessarily required everywhere that it thinks. So all I've done here is press this support icon in the top right corner. It's done a calculation. It's figured out where it needs them all. You can see these little grey pegs coming out of the bottom of the model. Um, and all I'm going to do here is press these plus platform and it's automatically going to generate all of those supports for me. Um, hopefully this is all going to going to work. There's a high failure rate with these machines. Um, it can push and pull the parts and it can distort the objects. Uh, the more supports generally the better. But if you can, if you go online, you can fix this, but I don't have time for that. So I just do that and then press the uh, cog and kit menu again, the layer and then do slice. Just press OK. can take a while to do this depending on your machine and you'll see now that we've got a preview and we go down the model and we can see all of those shapes being generated so that looks pretty cool I'm quite happy with that there's no gaps no obvious gaps for 10 layers or something um, everything appears to be um, optimal when it comes to uh, printing um, so for example you then do save save to the desktop save it to USB stick and we can export that to the fancy machine I'm just going back and I'm flipping around a bit uh, but let's do um, everything that isn't this object which I think is that one isn't it yep uh, if I've got this and I say I do have a hole and I export this for laser cutting uh, 3d printing Test model hole. Let's open that back up in Kira. What if you can reset model? Reset all model positions. There we go. So that's the original one. And I'm going to open test model hole you can see straight away that there is a hole it's a really cool pattern actually uh, it's telling me that I've got an error it's called non-manifold so it means I've got a non-manifold edge uh, which uh, is either missing or it's got extraneous surfaces you can't have two faces on top of each other overlapping doesn't quite understand what's going on and you can't have objects with a hole in it. So this is an extreme example. Sometimes your holes are going to be so small and it might be around where an object booleaned in 
You know, it might be a hair width hole. It's very tricky to find an isolate. Uh, but if I do slice these and look at the preview, you know, I've got support on. So this is what it's supposed to look like. We've looked at that one already. Um, and this is one where it's got a hole in it. Now, if you go to print, uh, you know, it will print fine. But then after an, uh, two hours, you'll come back to the machine and you'll be like, what the hell's going on here? Uh, you know, you got half a bit there and half a bit here. Um, it's because you've got an error in your file. So always check. You can check in Rhino. If I do a mesh. And you can do a check mesh or check. Um, it's got 18 naked edges. It can cause problem if the ultimate goal is to 3D print or STL output. Uh, it's still calling it a valid mesh, but um, it is, as you can see, quite clearly broken. So um, check it in Rhino. Always make sure you do the visual preview in both Ultimaker and Chitty Box. Okay, uh, and bear in mind that when you get your objects back from the laser cutter, it will be in a bag uh, with no labels and no order to it. So be aware that you will be figuring out where things go and how things are stuck together. Uh, so yeah, so you've got the colors, really, the outlines, the artboards, the material types, make sure you name everything, and um, a little bit of Illustrator to learn, but it's pretty straightforward, especially coming from InDesign. Uh, the biggest thing is just getting quick at all the processes in order for you to make mistakes, fail fast, learn quick and adapt and overcome because uh, it is worth it it is really fun and um, i look forward to seeing what you guys produce thank you